Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing MicroFocus's stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. MicroFocus is a provider of software solutions. Its software portfolio includes identity access and security solutions, COBOL development and mainframe solutions, IT operations management tools, host connectivity solutions, collaboration and networking solutions, software defined storage, and enterprise Linux solutions. The firm helps organizations install, operate, and improve IT infrastructure and business applications. Its clients span a variety of industries, including healthcare, airlines, and the public sector. The company is headquartered in the UK and was founded in 1976. It went public in 2005 and trades on the New York Stock Exchange, London Stock Exchange, Pink Sheets, Deutsche Börse, and Mexican Bolsa. In 1981, it won the Queen's Award for SysCobol, a multi-compliant COBOL implementation for microcomputers. The Queen's Award is an awards program for British businesses who excel at international trade innovation, sustainable development, or promoting opportunity. It is the highest official UK award for British businesses. It had a lucrative business in its niche, but in 2017 that changed when it acquired the software business of Euler Packard Enterprise. It paid 2.5 billion in cash for Euler Packard and then proceeded to merge with its software business. The transformative deal together with debt and equity was valued at over $8 billion. After the transaction, Hewlett Packard shareholders owned 50.1% of the combined company. However, it became clear pretty soon to the stock market that the integration of the Hewlett Packard assets was not going according to plan. Revenue and profits of the combined company were not meeting forecasts. It appeared that MicroFocus had bitten off more than it could chew. Investors lost confidence and the stock crashed and kept on crashing. On March 19, 2018, its shares fell 55%. After the company warned of a sharp fall in revenue, its chief executive Chris Sue resigned. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid cap company, 2 billion market cap, they're trading at 610 a share and they have 336 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see the company has positive and pretty consistent free cash flow each year. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement it's revenue minus expenses. And that grows a lot from 2018 to 2019. Then it's a big negative in 2020, negative 3 billion. Revenue is a sales for the company and that's pretty consistent from 3.2 billion down to 3 billion. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. Below that is their operating expenses, and those were really high in 2020, so they had negative operating income that year, which is why they had such a big negative net income. This is from their annual report, and they mentioned they had 2.661 billion of operating loss. And that's mainly due to a $2.8 billion goodwill impairment. The main reason for the goodwill impairment was because of the Hewlett Packard deal. It wasn't doing as well as they thought it would do. And that was exacerbated by COVID-19. Everybody blames COVID-19 when they have losses. It's an easy way out. The way goodwill gets on the balance sheet is when you acquire a company for more than it's worth. If a company is worth $2 billion according to its balance sheet, meaning assets minus liabilities equals $2 billion, and you pay $3 billion for the company, then $1 billion is booked as goodwill. So I would just ignore goodwill. It's a non-cash item. It's kind of meaningless. Although the problem with goodwill is it makes your net income look really bad. 
because investors think the company is struggling, they might go bankrupt. They lost $3 billion. That's an accounting loss. Let me show you on the statement of cash flows what I mean. This is a company statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. So you can see in 2020, they generated the most operating cash flow, 678 million. Even though they had negative net income, you could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash. Because net income is your accounting profit and loss, it's not actual cash. So they're generating sufficient and healthy operating cash flow. And they spend about $100 million a year on CapEx. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. So the company does have a lot of free cash flow remaining. Free cash flow is used to pay a dividend, which they're starting to do again. They did cut it last year during COVID. Also free cash flow is used to buy back stock, pay down debt, or grow your business. They bought back over 2 billion of stock in 2019. That's another way to reward shareholders is to buy back stock because it decreases the shares outstanding, making your shares more valuable. They did reduce their debt load in 2019, 2020, and the trailing 12 months. They paid down more debt than they issued. Although in 2018, they issued 800 million of debt, they probably took on that debt to help them with the HP merger. This is the company's equity section of the balance sheet. They have two and a half billion of paid in capital. That's how much cash the company generated from selling its stock. That's not just a stock they sold in IPO. That's also shares they sold after the IPO. They have negative 1 billion of retained earnings. Retained earnings is a sum of all your prior net incomes minus the dividends you paid out. So that is negative, which isn't good. Part of the reason it's negative is because they paid a dividend for so many years. And also a big reason it's negative is last year from that big goodwill impairment. Before last year, they had positive retained earnings. Let's look at the capital structure. They have 3 billion of equity, 4.8 billion of debt. They're 39% equity, 61% debt. Their net debt is 4.1 billion. That's total debt minus cash. And their WAC is 11.2%. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's 7.1 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $6.4 billion. We divide that by 336 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $19. They're trading at $6, so they're trading at a 68% discount. It's a strong buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street values the company at $12 a share. They're also saying the stock is undervalued. Two analysts priced this stock and their average price target was $7.20. This is the stock since it started trading on the New York Stock Exchange. You can see the stock price was well over $30 in the beginning. And then it dropped a lot at one point and it was fairly steady for a while. Then it dropped, it was steady, then a big drop. Then it looks like it's fairly steady since then. So the stock has really suffered. And just because a stock is undervalued doesn't mean people are willing to pay $10, $20, $30 a share. If people don't have faith in a company, they don't trust the business decisions, a lot of people think the HP merger was a bad idea. So they don't trust management in the future. But I'm pretty sure the stock price will come up. It just may take a while. It could take several years for investors to realize this is a good company that generates healthy cash flow. This is a stock price the last 52 weeks and it was trading below $3 at one point. That would have been a great time to get it. And then it's doubled since then. It looks like it peaked at around $8.50, but then dropped recently. The stock did drop a lot on July 1st. They did have an earnings call and it wasn't bad news. They did mention they're setting aside $70 million to resolve a patent infringement. But this is not news. Investors have known about the patent infringement case for a while now. But this earnings call was pretty neutral. So I guess investors were expecting something really positive. And when they got something neutral, they sold off the stock. So it could be a good buying opportunity once again. The company did cut its dividend in 2020 to conserve cash due to COVID. I think this was a good idea. 
They did pay a dividend once again of 16 cents a share in March of this year. And on their website, they did announce they're going to pay a 9 cent dividend on August 6th. So it's a little hard to calculate their dividend yield because I don't know how much they're going to pay in future dividends or if they're going to pay any at all. So I'm just going to assume they pay another 8 cent dividend. So their dividend yield would be 5.08%. And the way I calculated that, I took the 16 cents plus 8 cents plus 8 cents, that's 32 cents, divided by the current stock price. And in previous years, they paid a much higher dividend, but their stock price was a lot higher back then. It does make sense to cut the dividend to be more in line with the stock price. We can't look at their payout ratio since they have negative net income. They're paying out 24% of their free cash flow. And this stock is pretty volatile. It has a beta of 2.53, so the stock moves two and a half times to market. It's only gone up 8% in the past 52 weeks while the S&P 500 went up 37%. The 52 week low was $3, the high was $8, and the stock is trading below its 200 day and 50 day moving average. 1.3 million shares were traded on average the past 10 days. Almost all the shares outstanding are on float. 14% are held by institutions. Only 0.17% of the shares are shorted. This stock has performed much worse than its industry and the market. It's up 11% in the past year, much worse than its industry of 37% and the market of 44%. In the past three years, it's down 59%. Its industry is up 147% and the market 64%. Analysts are forecasting their earnings to increase 50% but the revenue forecast is to decrease 3%. If you invested $10,000 when this company started trading on the New York Stock Exchange in 2017, you'd be at $3,000 today, that's a 70% loss. The biggest shareholder is Dodge and Cox at 17%, then BlackRock, M&G Investments, Vanguard, and Lance's Fidelity. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have negative net income, so we can't look at the PE. They have an amazing price to sales ratio below one. When a company has a price to sales below one, that means their annual revenue is higher than their market cap. So investors are paying 70 cents for $1 revenue. When a company has a really good price to sales ratio and negative net income, that's sometimes a value trap. That could be the case in this situation, but the reason they had negative net income was due to that large asset impairment, not due to their operational business. They have a really good price to book ratio of 0.7. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. And the way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is on the balance sheet. It's assets minus liabilities and they have three billion of equity, but negative six billion of tangible equity since they have nearly nine billion of intangible assets on their balance sheet. The way they got so many intangible assets on their balance sheet is all their acquisitions they've done. They have negative operating income, so they have negative ROIC, negative interest coverage ratio, and negative ROE. They cannot cover their current liabilities with their current assets, and their current assets are mainly cash of 700 million. So it looks like they're gonna be a little short because they had 427 million of free cash flow, negative 356 million working capital, and negative 100 million dollars of dividend payments. They may need to take on some debt financing to fund their business over the next 12 months. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of 18 companies in the same industry as Microfocus. And if Micro has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So we can't look at their PE because it's negative. They're doing much better than average in price to sales and price to book. They're below average in current ratio, ROE, and debt. And they're a pretty small company, only two billion market cap. And they do pay the highest dividend. They may cut their dividends, so I wouldn't bank on it. But currently it looks like their dividend yield is around 5%. To summarize, I have them trading at a 68% discount, but this could be a value trap. You might be waiting a really long time for other investors to drive the price higher. Because I think people are really scared to buy this stock. They don't trust the company too much. But I definitely like the company. They've been around a really long time for 45 years and they're still generating a good amount of revenue and free cash flows. There's a dark cloud that's hanging over this company from the HP merger. I think once things get sorted out and it might take another year or two, 
then maybe investors will have more confidence and start buying the stock again and drive the price higher. I rank their free cash flows 5 out of 10, their revenue 6 out of 10, and their ratios 5 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.